exponential functions and their graphs. Up to this point, we have studied algebraic functions such as rational functions and polynomial functions. Now we want to take a look at the transcendental functions, which include the non-algebraic functions like exponential or logarithmic functions. Obviously, in this video, we're talking about exponential functions, and an exponential function is essentially a function with a base number and with an exponent. So I want to familiarize ourselves with what happens when the base is between 0 and 1 or greater than 1 and what happens when the exponent is positive or negative. So let's just take a look at a typical exponential function, y equals 2 to the 4th. y equals 2 to the 4th gives me 16. Very easy to figure out. So we can evaluate exponential functions when we know both the x value and the a value. Now I want you to notice 2 to the 4th, obviously this number is getting bigger than 2. The base is 2, the exponent is 4. If I said y is equal to 2 to the negative 4, this number is much smaller than 2. And in fact, it is the same as 1 divided by 2 to the fourth power. That's exactly what that negative exponent is going to do for us. We can also evaluate exponential functions when the base is between 0 and 1. So for instance, what if my base was 1 half and I'm taking 1 half to the fourth power? Well now I have 1 half to the fourth, so the base is 1 half and the exponent is 4, and notice that's the same as 1 divided by 2 to the 4th, or the same as 2 to the negative 4th power. So if you end up with the base that is, in fact, between 0 and 1, it's just like having a negative exponent. Now, if I took this to the negative 4th power, what do you think would happen? Well, now I'm back up here to 2 to the 4th. Why is that? because 1 half is the same as 2 to the negative 1. And then if I take that to the fourth power, oops, I got something messed up here. And then if I take that to the fourth power, then I end up with the same value of 0 0.0625 or 1 16th. Let's take a look now at what the graph of an exponential function will look like. So if the graph has the form y equals a of x, you're going to have the following property. The domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. Obviously, I'm only showing you a little bit of that, but I can zoom out so you can see exactly what that graph continues to look like. The domain is everything. The range is from 0 to infinity. The intercept here is 0, 1. Uh, and it's cr increasing everywhere unless I change a to negative x. I'm sorry, the exponent to negative x. And now it's decreasing everywhere. You can see how that just flipped. And then back to positive. Uh, keep in mind that when we're flipping that x to negative, we're just reflecting across that y-axis. Um, there's going to be an asymptote at y equals 0, which is this line. And it's continuous everywhere and 1 to 1. 1 to 1 implies that it can pass the horizontal line test, or for each output it only maps back to one input. So I want you to kind of see, I'm going to get rid of that asymptote, I want you to kind of see what happens as a gets bigger. So I'm just going to do my slider. And why don't I just zoom back in? So I can see exactly what's happening. The closer I get to 1 down here, the more sort of squished down it's going to be. As my number gets bigger, that slope gets steeper of that curved line. Now what happens if I change my slider to be between 0 and 1? 
and now I let it move. Again, remember this is just like if we had that negative exponent, and obviously it can't equal one, but if we have that negative exponent, remember it looked just like this, it was flipped over, it still has the same intercept, but now it's decreasing instead of increasing, unless of course I make it negative here too, because now it's sort of like a double negative, which is a positive. So this is what the graph of an exponential function will look like. Now I do want to keep in mind that we have learned all sorts of translations, reflections, and so forth. So those work the same way as we did before. If I take this times five, notice now instead of zero one, I'm at zero five. I could take it times a fraction. I could add two to the outside. And now again, it's shifted up two more places. I could add two up here. And that point that was at uh, zero seven is now at two seven. So we get the idea we can still do all of the same transformations that we had previously. We've already talked about the fact that an exponential function is one-to-one. -one. That is, for every output, it maps back to only one input. And we can use that property to solve for variables if our exponential functions have the same base. So in later sections, we'll learn how to solve an exponential equation no matter what. But in this case, only if they have the same base, we can basically rewrite these to be in the same base. So 16 is the same as 4 squared, but 4 can actually be broken down into 2 times 2. So 16 is 2 to the fourth power. 2 times 2 is 4 times 2 is 8 times 2 is 16. Now we talked about the fact that 1 half was the same as 2 to the negative 1. It's the reciprocal of 2, which means what I have is actually 2 to the fourth is equal to 2 to the negative x power because negative one times x, we're going to multiply those exponents. That means I can solve by setting the exponents equal to one another to get that negative four is equal to x. Now you can always check that. You can say, does that make sense that one half to the negative four is equal to 16? Well, one half to the negative one, so let's think about this as negative one times positive four. One half to the negative one would be two. Remember that negative flips over the um, base and it finds the reciprocal of the base. And now I have two to the four and two to the four is in fact 16. So I know that I've done it correctly. Five and then x minus one. So five to the x minus one is equal to 125. 125 is five times five times five, or five cubed. Again, I have the same base, so I can say x minus one is equal to three, so x must be equal to four. And again, I can check that if I want. Five to the four minus one, does that equal 125? Five to the third does in fact equal 125, and so I know that I did it correctly x is negative 4 for my first question and positive 4 for my second. Let's take a look now at a common application involving exponential functions, which is interest. Interest is the money that you earn if you are investing money in a bank or the stock market or wherever else, or it is the money that you have to pay as a fee for borrowing money from someone else. So we're going to focus on investing because, you know, let's just pretend we're making money here instead of spending it. And the formula that we're going to use is A equals P times the quantity one plus R divided by N to the NT power. This is obviously an exponential function. The exponent is N times T. A in this function represents the accumulated amount. So that's going to be, in the case of investing, the amount in your investment account at the end of whatever time you're going to put it in the account for. So the end of T years. P is the principal. That's how much you're investing. Or of course, if you were borrowing, that's how much you would be borrowing. R is the rate. Make sure that you write that in decimal form. So generally you're going to get rate as a percentage. N is the number of compoundings per year. So let me explain briefly how compounding works. 
when interest is compounded, it's taken and put back into your account. So not only are you earning interest on the principal, but you're earning interest on the interest that you've already earned that has now been added back to your account. So the more often that money is added back to your account, the more money you're making because you're making um, money on a larger principal because that principal, even though that's what you invested, you're adding to that money that you're earning interest on. Uh, T is the time always in years. So what we're going to do, you can see I have this function here in Desmos and Desmos is telling me I have no idea what you're trying to do. There's way too many variables. So what we're going to do is take a look at this fictional question that I've made up and plug in numbers into the correct place and talk about what happens uh, or what the difference would be investing 15,000 for five years at 4.5% based on how often that money is compounded. So let's take a look. We have 15,000 invested. Well, 15,000 is how much the principal is. That's how much we begin with. The annual rate is 4.5%, so don't make the mistake of writing 4.5 just because there happens to be a decimal in the percentage. We need to write that percentage as a decimal, so 0 0.045. We're moving the decimal two places to the left. Uh, we'll come back to N because that's going to be the value that changes, but T is the time and that's five years. So I have my equation and the only thing left to put in is N. So I left N blank because I'm either going to do this quarterly, monthly, or daily. Quarterly means it happens each quarter, which is ab about every three months. So it is four times per year. So four and four. And I can see that in five years, I went from 15000 to $18,761.26. I feel pretty good about that. What if instead I did this monthly? So now instead of every three months that money's put back into my account to earn more interest, now it's every one month or 12 times per year. And I can see that I have in fact earned more money. So I have this amount minus this amount. I've made an extra $15.68. Now let's do that one more time. I'm going to take all of this. Forgot my A, I think. And instead of 12, I'm going to replace it with daily. So 365.25 days per year, but we'll just stick with 365. And I can see again in five years, I've made, you know, a little bit more. So if I compare that to the original, just every quarter, I've made an extra $23.32. The natural exponential function. Quite often when we're dealing with exponential functions, which we've just learned about, we deal with applications where the base is not a number like two or three or four, but in fact, it's an irrational number, which is E. Uh, e is approximately equal to 2.718281828 and so on. Uh, notice that the dot, dot, dot at the end means that it goes on forever, but does not have a repeating pattern, which is because it is an irrational number. If it had a repeating pattern, it would in fact be rational. Um, the value of E is called the natural base. So the function is F of X is equal to E of X instead of F of X is equal to A of X, which is our typical exponential function. Um, but the the good news is it's the same. Um, all of the uh, functions, sorry, properties of our graphs are still the same. The domain, negative infinity to positive infinity, the range zero to infinity, which means of course it's not dipping below that Y axis. Um, the Y intercept is still in the same place, zero one. We have an asymptote at Y equals zero and it's increasing everywhere unless I give it the negative x, in which case it's decreasing everywhere, continuous everywhere, and one-to-one. -one. And just as we talked about before, 
I can change up the graph by doing any of the little transformations that I've talked about before, um, which would, you know, shift our graph right or left, flip it over the X or Y, and so forth. We've already taken a look at an application where we are finding the interest based on an investment of $15,000 for five years um, at a rate of 4.5%. So hopefully you're joining us from our last video where we were talking about just exponential functions and we looked at this application. If not, we looked at a slightly different function than what we have here. We had A is equal to P and then we had one plus r divided by n, and then to the nt. And that's where all of these values came from for compounded quarterly, which is four times a year, monthly, which is 12 times a year, and daily, which is 365 times a year. Now we're going to look at um, interest compounded continuously which means it's never just sitting there waiting to be put back into your account, it's immediately put back into your account to continue making interest on top of your interest. Um, so basically, this section here on the inside, and this has to do with calculus, which is why we're not going to go through where the E came from. We will when you get into calculus, this is just pre-calculus. So essentially the limit of this interior function approaches E. So now we've got P and then E to the R, and this is instead of N, it's going to be R, T. So this is the function for compounded continuously. Now instead of P, just as I did before, I'm going to replace P with 15,000. That's how much money I'm investing. E is E, the irrational number. R is my rate, so as I did before, 0.045, not 4.5, but 0 0.045, and then a time of five years. And I can see that I have made almost the same amount as daily, because daily and continuously are very near the same thing. So if I take a look at comparing these two, I've really only made an extra, say, 26, 7, 8, 28 cents. Um, and so again, I can find that value. So 26 cents, as that's not much over five years. But again, if I compare it to compounded quarterly, or even compounded yearly, which would be worse, I can see that the difference in the amount would be quite a bit. Up next is section 3.2 of Larson's 11th edition pre-calculus, um, which is logarithmic functions and their graphs.